Good morning and welcome to Grace. My name's Katie. I'm the music director here. It's time to start our worship by standing and singing together our welcome song. It's called Immortal Invisible. It's on page two of your bulletin. Let's all stand and sing together. feel covered in shame, for all who feel guilty, for all who feel the great brokenness inside of you and the brokenness in this world, this church open wide her doors and welcomes you in the strong and forgiving name of Jesus. Welcome on this chilly morning. My name is Marshall Brown. I'm one of the pastors here. Uh, glad to see so many of you here in the cold as well as those of you who are joining us online. Our call to worship this morning comes from Isaiah 6. Would you read responsively with me? I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him stood the seraphim. Each had six wings. With two he covered his face. With two he covered his feet. And with two he flew. And one called to another and said together, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. Our great God, you are the holy God. And as we come into your presence, we come knowing that we need you to show up, to draw us to yourself, to draw us out of our shame and our guilt and our hiding, which is to say, Lord, we need your Holy Spirit to be with us. So come now, Holy Spirit, and be among your people. For Christ's sake we pray. Amen. We'll continue singing together, Holy Spirit. There's nothing worth more that could ever come close. Nothing can compare. You're our living hope. Your presence, Lord. I've tasted and seen of the sweetest of loves. When my heart becomes free and my shame is undone, your presence, Lord. Holy Spirit, you are welcome here. Come flood this place and fill the atmosphere. Your glory. God is what our hearts long for, to be overcome by your presence, Lord, your presence, Lord. I've tasted and seen of the sweetest of loves. 
When my heart becomes free and my shame is undone, your presence, Lord. Holy Spirit, you are welcome here. Come flood this place and fill the atmosphere. Your glory, God, is what our hearts long for, to be overcome by your presence, Lord. Your presence, Lord. Let us become more aware of your presence. Let us experience the glory of your goodness. Let us become more aware of your presence. Let us experience the glory of your goodness. Let us become more aware of your presence. Let us experience the glory of your Please be seated. <clears throat> As we come into the presence of God, which we've just been singing about, it says we come into a place where our hearts become free and our shame is undone. Our time of confession is a moment when we can acknowledge our sin and do so freely, knowing that our sins are forgiven and all of our shame, all of our guilt is undone. God sees us, loves us, and forgives us. Please join me now as we together read our prayer of confession. All-knowing God and Father, you have searched us and you know us. You see every deed, hear every word, and discern every thought. You know our hidden faults and you see our secret sins, our pride, lust, envy, bitterness, and gratitude, and unbelief. In your great mercy, O Lord, cover our transgressions in the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Forgive the sin within us and renew us by your Spirit that we may walk in the ways of everlasting life. Amen. Please take some time now to silently confess your sins. Please stand now and hear the assurance of pardon offered to us through Jesus Christ. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God and are justified by His grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. We'll continue singing together, Oh, How Good It Is. How good. Sing to the Lord and with one. 
and I'm the director of children's ministry. At this time, I'm going to dismiss our explore to go downstairs, which is our fifth and sixth grade, and then I'm going to ask fourth grade and under to come join me down here. And now, if you can see my picture on there, you're in a good spot. If you can see my picture, you're in a perfect spot. That's amazing. go. Oh, then I'll probably go ahead and move it. How about that? Okay. Great. Come and have a seat, guys. Over the last couple of weeks, not only your parents, but us, we've been looking at the beginning. We've been looking at creation in Genesis. And this is, this is a little bit of a review, and I have a question for you guys. Can you follow me? And if I say the word God said, can you do? It was good. Can you do that for me? Thumbs up. It was good. Okay, great. So we saw at the beginning that God created the heavens and he made um, light and darkness and he said. And then he separated the skies from the water and he said. And then he created the plants and the trees and he said. And he created the sun and the moon and he said. And he created the birds and the fish in the sea and he said. And then he created the animals to walk along the ground and men and women. And he said it was very good. good. And then he rested. Now, let me see if you've been listening in Sunday school. Why did God create all these things? Go ahead, Topper. Because of his glory. Glory is a very tricky word. And sometimes we forget what it means. Sometimes I forget what it means. So let me explain it to you this way. Imagine LeBron, the best basketball player ever, playing for the (laughs) best. Playing for the best team ever, Miami Heat. Okay, 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 humor me. Just imagine your favorite basketball player in your favorite team, even though Miami Heat is the best. And imagine that basketball player from across the court. Take a basketball and throw it all the way across the court and make a basket. The crowd goes wild. Everybody goes, man, he's good. LeBron, or your favorite basketball players, has just shown his greatness, how good he is. He has just shown his glory as a basketball player. Well, a little bit like that, when we look at everything that God had made, when we look at each other, when we look at nature, when we look at everything that God had made, it shows God's greatness. It shows his glory. And it's not only good. Can you do it with me? Good. But it's very good. And God's creation is mega, mega. Look with me. Cool. C-O-O-L. Can you do cool? Cool. Oh, come on. You can do this. Cool. Let's pray. Dear loving Father, thank you for basketball. And thank you for your creation. And thank you that you show us your glory, your greatness as we look all around us. Help us to do that today, to say how good and great you are. In Jesus' name, amen. 
Okay, pre-K and kinder, you're going to go downstairs with one of your parents, and first through fourth, join Miss Susan in the back. For the rest of us, you may stand now and greet one another passing the peace of Christ. Be seated. You may be seated. Our mission at Grace is to welcome our neighbors to grow together in Christ and serve God in our community and world. We've been seeing a lot of new faces, those who are visiting our church. And if that is you, if you're relatively new or if this is your first Sunday, you can fill out a welcome card by following the QR code in your bulletin or by finding one in the back of the pew in front of you. Please fill that out. You can drop it in one of the offering boxes sprinkled throughout the sanctuary or in the lobby. This allows you to ask any questions you may have about the church. We as pastors would be happy to meet with you, tell you more about the church, or connect you to what God is doing here at Grace. For our guests, feel no obligation to give. For all the rest, if you would like to give, there are a number of ways in which you can do so. There are offering boxes sprinkled throughout the sanctuary in the lobby. You can pick up a self-addressed stamped envelope at the welcome table in the lobby as well. Uh, or you can give online uh, by, going, by following the QR code or by going to gracenorthshore.org. One brief announcement before I welcome someone up to uh, give a, a quick financial update. We have a congregational meeting today immediately following the service. We will have child care in the infant and toddler room. Uh, please plan to stay after the service today. It will be relatively brief. We're going to try and keep it as brief as possible. But we'd love to give you some updates on the building, finances, and some other key things going on in the life of the church. Now I'd like to welcome Chris Nyland. Chris is our finance committee chair, and he's going to give a quick financial update. Thanks, Nick. Uh, as Nick mentioned, I'm Chris Nyland. I serve on the finance committee uh, here at the church. Um, I want to, first of all, just recap. It's been a wonderful year of generosity in our church. In the past year, we've accomplished a great deal. Um, with funds raised outside of our church, we were able to purchase a property in Evanston that serves our uh, Northwestern um, campus ministries that we help support. Uh, we closed on the purchase of 760 Cherry, which is just adjacent to the church to give us the option to expand this facility. Uh, and we raised roughly a million dollars to both buy that property without incurring any indebtedness and to sort of plant the seed for the Renew campaign that uh, you're gonna hear more about if you stay around for the congregational meeting. Uh, we're, thank you, we're thankful for your continued support and generosity and grateful that God provides uh, for us all. We truly couldn't do this uh, without you. Um, every, not every week, but every month or so, we try to print a update and the bulletin, you'll see it's on uh, page six. It's just a year-to-date uh, contributions and annual budget. Our fiscal year uh, ends in March, so the, the fiscal years are through March. Uh, as a reminder, our year in giving in December and January makes up by far our largest period of giving uh, during the year for the church. Um, uh, through December, we've received $1.27 million, you'll see. That's approximately $200,000 below what we would have expected to see on our budget of 1.8. Uh, we have sufficient cash reserves to absorb 
kind of any, any budget miss, so we're not worried about that. But we certainly want to try to meet our budget uh, through the end of the year. We have till the end of March uh, to make up the difference. Uh, during December, our website was down. You may have heard about that uh, for a bit. That may have prevented donations. That's now fixed. So if you had issues, I would encourage you to revisit any donations or any giving you had planned. Uh, one other note, uh, we recently switched uh, providers for receiving non-cash giving. So if you want to give either appreciated public stock, uh, uh, portions of private businesses, or even real estate, we're now working with a firm called NCF, the National Christian Foundation, which is uh, a professional organization to be able to streamline any kind of non-cash giving that you may want to give. Uh, if you have questions on that, you can let me know. You can also email accounting at gracenorthshore.com, accounting at gracenorthshore.com, and someone will get back to you. Uh, and then in general, if you ever have any financial questions, you can, add, you can talk to myself, uh, Dennis McCrary, Patty, Lydia Mathis, we're the finance committee at the church. Uh, we're really committed to financial transparency, accountability. We want to make sure you have a full picture on any questions you may have uh, about the church's finances. And then finally, th thanks again. Like we, The church's mission couldn't exist. We couldn't do this without the generosity of this organization and this congregation. So we're, we're thankful through all the ups and downs of the past couple of years we've been able to get through without any serious financial hiccups. And thank you for your continued generosity. Nick, Marshall. Thanks, Chris. Uh, if you have any questions for Chris, you can also stay after for the congregational meeting today and there'll be an opportunity for some Q&A if you have any questions about the finances of the church. And I'd like to welcome Bruce Williamson up for the reading of God's word. Please rise if you're able. Genesis 3, 1 through 24, the fall. Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God actually say you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said, you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it lest you die. But the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman said that the tree was good for food, and that it was a delight to the eyes, and the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. And she also gave some to her husband, who was with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both were open, and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. And they heard the sound of the Lord, God walking in the garden of in the cool of the day, and the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord, God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man and said to him, Where are you? And he said, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid, because I was naked and I hid myself. He said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree which I commanded you not to eat? The man said, The woman whom you gave to me to be with me, she gave me fruit of the tree, and I ate. Then the Lord said to the woman, What is this that you have done? The woman said, The serpent deceived me, and I ate. The Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock and above all beasts of the field. On your belly you shall go, and dust you shall eat, and all the days of your life. I will put an enemy between you and the woman, and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. To the woman he said, I will surely multiply your pain in childbearing. In pain you shall bring forth children. Your desire shall be contrary to your husband, but he shall rule over you. <clears throat> and to Adam he said, because you have listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten of the tree, of which I commanded you, you shall not eat of it. 
Cursed is the ground because of you. In pain you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Thorn and thistles it shall bring forth for you. And you shall eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face you shall eat bread. Till you return to the ground, for out of it you are taken, for you are dust, and to dust you will return. The man called his wife's name Eve, because she was the mother of all living. And the Lord God made for, Eve, made for Adam and for his wife garments of skins and clothed them. Then the Lord said, Behold, the man has become like one of us, knowing good and evil, but lest he reach out his hand and, also, and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore, the Lord God sent him out from the garden to work the ground from which he has taken. He drove out the man, and at the east of the garden of Eden, he placed a cherubim and a flame sword that turned every way to guard the way to the tree of life. This is the word of the Lord. Well, again, my name is uh, Marshall. If I haven't met you, I hope to get a chance to, uh, to meet you uh, after the service at some point. I hope you can stay for the congregational meeting, which I do hope will be brief. You know, there's some things that are uh, debatable, and then there's things that are just wrong. And LeBron is not the greatest. Uh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Diana and I will have a conversation later. So the greatest played in Chicago. Uh, let's pray before we look at uh, this passage of Scripture. Our great God, we, uh, the, the passage that we have just heard read, that we have just read, is, is sobering, it is sad, but it is also hopeful and redemptive. And so God, I pray that you would open our eyes to all parts of Genesis chapter 3, that we may see uh, both the truth about who we are, but even more important, the glory of your redemption. For Christ's sake we pray, amen. We are several weeks into a sermon series that we're calling God's Big Picture, God's Big Picture. And the, the design of the sermon, we're about to pick up speed tremendously. We've kind of slowed down these first two weeks. But the design of this, the sermon series is to see how all of the different parts of the Bible, the Bible is written over 1,500 years, 66 books, uh, how all the different parts of the Bible relate to one another uh, but also how all of the Bible relates to your life. And the goal for this sermon series, God's Big Picture, is there's at least three goals. One is to help us all better understand our Bibles. It's also to help us understand our lives better. And then finally to see how every story, every page of the Bible whispers Jesus' name and points to him. Now, last week, if you were with us, Nick preached a great sermon on the creation accounts of Genesis 1 and Genesis 2. The creation, this beautiful picture of God's people living in God's place, under God's authority, with God's blessing. God's people in God's place, under God's authority, experiencing God's blessing. And one of the more moving parts of the sermon from last week, Nick stopped and asked us to imagine, in fact, asked us to remember, when is the moment in your life that you found your work to be the most fulfilling? A day at the office, a day working at home where you just felt so fulfilled. He asked us to remember a time when your relationships felt most rich, maybe with your spouse or with a good friend. He asked us to imagine that day that you just felt rested, that you felt at peace, or a moment that you felt most connected to God, most spiritually alive. And he pointed out that those moments, whether it's relational or at work or in rest or with God, that those moments are a beautiful taste of the created goodness of Genesis 1 and 2. I think the most evocative image of Genesis 1 and 2 is the very last line when it says that our first parents, Adam and Eve, were naked, but they were not ashamed. 
They were naked, but they were not ashamed. They were at peace with themselves. They were at peace with one another. They were at peace with God. They were at peace with the created order, with all things. Such a beautiful picture of active peace. And the story of creation, the story of Genesis 1 and 2, begs a question. From there, how did we get here? How did we get here to a world of brokenness and disappointment, a world of death and sickness, a world of holocaust and hatred? How did we get here? Well, we got here because of and through Genesis chapter 3, the fall, the rebellion, the sin of our first parents. They say that of all the, of all the Christian doctrines, that of everything that Christians believe, the easiest to prove, the easiest Christian doctrine to prove is original sin. It's the easiest doctrine to prove. You just look at your own life. You just look in the mirror. You just look at the world. Read the paper. Read the internet. And here we have it. But this passage, I want to argue this morning, this passage doesn't just prove something. This passage explains something. It explains the world, and more personally, it explains your life. Because this passage explains the brokenness that you experience personally. You ever felt lonely despite being in a crowd of people who you know intellectually love you? Ever felt lonely? This passage explains when you feel shame that you're just not good enough, that you have not done enough. Maybe you're a coward or you failed in some way. This passage explains the war that you feel. There's something good you want to do, but you know you're not going to do it. This passage explains the unrequited longings to be married, to be happily married, to have children. But it doesn't just explain personal. This passage explains the brokenness that we experience socially. Have you ever lost a friendship because of a misunderstanding? It's just gone. Have you gone through a divorce? If you're estranged from your parents or from your children, or maybe it's just the silly fight you had with your spouse last week. that for, You can't even remember what it was, but it escalated. got ugly, and you can't even remember why. This passage has explanatory power for that, but it's not just that. This power has explanatory power for the brokenness that we see in the world, the systemic brokenness, broken systems, broken nations, war, terror, violence. Quite frankly, it's a lot easier to illustrate just these days than it was even six months ago, right? But this also explains the brokenness we see in the created order, earthquakes, forest fires, hurricanes, disease. I have a friend in the hospital with COVID right now. The whole pandemic, I mean, think about the pandemic, the death, the failed policies, the broken trust, the yelling, the screaming, all of it, all of the pandemic, they are an echo and a result of Genesis chapter 3. Because here's the deal. If you take the beauty and the dignity of Genesis 1 and 2, the beauty God created all things good, the longing and the desire we have for those things. If you take Genesis 1 and 2 with the teaching here in Genesis 3 about the fall, sin, rebellion, if you take those two things, these two, three passages, these three chapters, I should say, you'll get a long way towards understanding your life. I'll be honest, Genesis 1, 2, and 3 are a big part of why I actually believe in Christianity because they have tremendous explanatory power for my life and the world I see. They explain the world. I studied some philosophy in, in, in uh, college. Uh, and this, this worldview of Genesis 1 2, it better explains the world for me in my life than does Buddhism or secularism or materialism or scientism or any other philosophy. This just explains the world as well as any system of thought that I know. And my contention is if you can get Genesis 1 2 and 3 deep down in your bones, you won't just understand the Bible better you'll understand your life better. Now, we've got to cover a lot of ground this morning. But before we do, there's two things that I want to say about this passage. The first thing about Genesis 3 is it is mysterious. There are things in this passage that are mysterious. Okay, we have talking snakes, we have flaming swords, and we have a God walking in a garden. And there's some things that are simply not explained, other things that are not addressed. 
For instance, the origin of evil is not addressed. The nature of the serpent is not addressed. There are things that we don't have answers to. We just have to say, I don't know. We don't know. The Bible is silent. There is mystery here. But make no mistake, because secondly, this is a historical account. This is super important. Christianity is a religion that is based on facts, historical facts, not just metaphors. God created. Now, Christians differ as to how God created, whether it was six days or however long. Christians differ. But we all agree as a Christian that God created. And that Adam and Eve were real people who sinned and plunged us into despair. And we believe that. I believe that, I should say. I believe that because it says here that it happened, but also because Jesus and the New Testament both assume this happened and state that it happened. Actually, I think that's the reason I believe these are real people is because Jesus and the New Testament testify to the historicity, the factuality of Adam and Eve. So it's a mystery and it's historical. So, but let's see three things this morning. The fall... (laughs) The redemption and the big picture. First, the fall. Look with me at these first seven verses because what happens in these first seven verses with the first human sin, the first rebellion is so very typical. Adam and Eve's first act of rebellion against God's authority, they frankly look a lot like your rebellion and mine. Verse 1. Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, did God actually say? Now look closely. This is so subtle. This is so brilliantly written. Because the first, the first thing the serpent says is, did God say? But before the serpent had spotted speaking, God is called the Lord God. The narrator refers to him as the Lord God. Serpent calls him just God. The word Lord is God's covenantal name. It's his personal name. In Hebrew, it is Yahweh. When, when, God asked, when Moses says, what shall I call you? God says, call me by this name, Yahweh. And Satan omits that. It is his personal name. Now, some of you call me Pastor Marshall, which is great, which is fine. I, I love that. But let me tell you which of those two names means more to me between Pastor and Marshall. Marshall, by a long shot, okay? It's my personal name. Pastor, that's just a title I share with Nick, right? Uh, Marshall is what means to me. The serpent... Hear what he's doing. See what the serpent is doing. The serpent removes God's personal name. He simply calls him generic God. He is depersonalizing God, right? He's just the big guy in the sky, right? The good Lord. The first step towards sin always involves distancing yourself, depersonalizing the living God, making him distant and not. Does God actually say Does God actually say you, and it's actually plural, does God actually say y'all shall not eat of any tree in the garden? Satan is framing the conversation. He's spinning a web. Because God actually said they could eat of any tree of the garden. He could eat of any tree, but he is deceitfully spinning a web. God's goodness is being questioned. Contrary to the fact of what God has said, God is being portrayed just by suggestion as a killjoy who does not know what is best for you. Eve, subtly, she takes the bait. Verse 2, the woman says to the serpent, we may eat of the tree of the fruit of the garden, but God said you shall not eat of the tree that is in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. If you go back and look at Genesis 2, God never said anything about touching. God said nothing about touching. He only talked about eating this one piece of fruit. Eve is falling into the trap. She is adding to God's word. She is adding to God's law, which is to say she's making God look ridiculous, not good, unloving. She's making God look mean. Now the trap is almost set. Verse 4, the the serpent says to the woman, you shall not die. What he's saying is sin and rebellion against God are not a big deal. They're just not a big deal. There is no judgment, the serpent is saying, for disobeying God. And at this point, the web is almost fully spun. Verse 5, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be open. You will be like God. You see, at core, disobeying and sin is saying that God is not God. I am God. 
I will determine my own reality. And all of this web brings us to verse 6, which seals your fate and mine. Verse 6, let me read it again. So the, when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was a delight to the eyes, and that it was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. She also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate. So simple, so devastating, so common. From this moment on, everything has a crack in it. Everything has a crack in it from this moment on. Our relationship to God, our relationship to ourselves, our relationship to one another, our relationship to the creation of all things. Everything is broken from this moment. From this moment, we have a sin that we are born with. We have a virus that we're born with. It's called sin. They will not be finally eradicated until Jesus comes to make all things new. Now, we're sprinting today, so I can't take the time. But I need you to see that the pattern of Genesis 3, what we just saw with Adam and Eve, the pattern of Genesis 3, verses 1 to 5, fits you. And it fits me. Because whenever we enter into some sort of sin, it is some combination of depersonalizing God of doubting his goodness, of denying the severity and seriousness of sin, and of wanting to be God. Every sin is some combination of depersonalizing God, doubting his goodness, denying the severity of sin, and wanting to be God. It leads to our rebellion. I could illustrate this with so many. I, I tried to make a list of all the ways I could illustrate this. I could illustrate this with pornography and adultery. I could illustrate this with alcoholism, with an overlove of comfort, escape. I could illustrate this with materialism. I could illustrate this with Amazon Prime. I could illustrate this with Botox. I could illustrate this with NFL football. I could illustrate this with golf. I could illustrate this with greed, pride, wanting to be successful, a cult of achievement. I could illustrate it with the number one temptation on the North Shore as I see it. An unyielding commitment to our children's happiness and success above all other things. Now this rebellion for Adam and Eve does not end well. Rebellion against God never ends well. Hear this, friends. Sin is its own reward. The only reward of sin is the moment that you do it, that it feels good. The aftershocks are always awful. The consequences of this fall into sin are laid out in verses 7 and following. They are a preview of life broken by sin and the life that you and I live. Now because we are sprinting, I'm going to rattle off eight consequences very quickly and then I'm going to focus on one. But you need to see this. Look with me as I wake, make our way through. Verses 11 to 13, we see blame shifting. What is the first consequence of being broken? We shift the blame. God asks Adam, have you eaten? And Adam says, the woman made me do it. And then he asked the woman, and he said, well, look at the servant. Blame shifting. That's the first consequence. The second, is, the second consequence is enmity with the evil one. Verse 15, there's real conflict with evil. Third consequence Pain in childbearing and in child rearing. That's verse 16, the first part. The next consequence, fourth, relational strain. The way it says that your, your, your desire will be for your husband and he will rule over you. Broken relationships, not just in marriage, but in everything. Fifth consequence, the ground will be cursed. The creation will pre present problems. There will be disease and natural disaster. Sixth consequence, there will be pain in our work. The way that it talks about it is there will be thorns and thistles. The ultimate consequence for sin is seventh, death. To dust you will return. I recently officiated a wedding, excuse me, a funeral, uh, and I did the, the committal service where you go to the gravesite. It is such a sobering moment, such finality that the final consequence of sin is death. And the last, the eighth consequence here is intimacy with God. They are banished out of the garden, out of the intimate presence with God. And we feel all those. I mean, it could be a whole sermon series on each one of those consequences. But the one I want to focus on is the first that is lifted in the story. The first consequence that we see is that security and intimacy are replaced by mistrust 
and alienation. The first consequence of sin is that we hide in our shame and our fear. Look with me at verse 7. Then the eyes of both were open, and they knew they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together, and they made themselves loincloths. Now just remember from last week, just a few verses before, humanity is described as naked and unashamed. Naked, unashamed. And now they are literally sewing fig leaves together and hiding from each other and from God with loincloths. Now, why loincloths, right? Why not, you know, if you're going to make your first clothes, why wasn't the first clothes a hat <laughs> or a scarf? Why, you know, why wasn't it shoulder pads? Why loincloths? Because they're covering a place where there's the greatest experience of intimacy. And they want it to be hidden. They want to be hidden. They are ashamed. And what is shame? Shame is the suspicion that you cannot be fully loved if you are fully known. That you can't be both fully known and fully loved. And so they hide. And we hide. We cover up with loincloths. We can't let anyone know us, not fully in the deep recesses of who we are, the first consequence of the fall. Now, our loin costs have gotten a little more sophisticated. <laughs> we hide behind achievement and work, Ch our children's success. We hide behind literal makeup. We hide behind our cars, our houses. We hide behind our religious performance. Some of us hide by being self-deprecating. We hide behind our fig leaves, desperately afraid that if people knew us for who we really are, or if God did, they would be repulsed. We all have our loincloths. We all feel the shame, and we all hide, and we put on masks to try to present something that we are not. You see, I've sprinted through this, but the temptation, the fall, the consequences of Genesis 3, in a word, they are awful. And it explains the hurt you feel, the hurt you see. It explains it all right here. And for so often, when I talk about Genesis 3, that's how I think about it. But as I studied this week, I came to realize something. And that is this, that more than being about the fall and redemption, Genesis, uh, fall, Genesis 3 is about redemption, <laughs> It is about God's pursuit of his people. As awful as these first part of verses of Genesis 3 are, the second half of Genesis 3 is about God's love, his pursuit, his redemption. There is so much, it's crazy to me to say this, there is so much good news in Genesis chapter 3. I want to see a couple of things. First, I want to see, see how God enters the scene. See how God enters the scene after this first sin has occurred. He does not come with shame. He does not come with accusation. He does not come with judgment. <laughs> how does he enter the scene? He comes with questions. He comes to the garden, verse 8 and verse 9, but the Lord God called the man and says, Where are you? Where are you? The, God's first words after the fall, they're not rebuke. They're not accusation. They are a question, which is to say they are an invitation to relationship, God is moving towards his children. He is pursuing it. I just need to ask you, where are you? God is asking you this morning, where are you? And he doesn't ask that in shame or reproach. He asks that in love and redemption because what happens next? He first pursues with questions. But once he figures out what has happened, he knows God is determined to put this broken world back together. Once he's spoken with Adam and Eve, he turns to the serpent, who is the evil one, Satan. Again, mystery. And he says this. Look with me at verse 15. Verse 15 is very important in the Bible. Genesis 3.15. He says this. God does to the Satan, to the serpent. I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your offspring and her offspring. God is saying, you have hurt someone I love. And I'm declaring war on you. I am fighting back. And I want you to notice something real quick. You have an enemy. We don't talk about this enough probably, but you have an enemy that wants to hurt you and see you fall, and his name is Satan. It is true. But he goes on. Verse, the second half of verse 15, God speaking to the serpent says, 
he, the offspring of the woman shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. Now that doesn't sound like much of a verse, but friends, that is the gospel of Jesus Christ. Theologians call this the proto-gospel, the first gospel. This right here, Genesis 3.15, is the first prophecy of Jesus. Eve's offspring is Jesus. And God is saying that Satan will bruise Jesus' heel. That will be Jesus' death. But Jesus will bruise Satan's head. Now, a bruised heel hurts, but a bruised head kills. Genesis 3.15 is pointing forward through time to the crucifixion of Jesus. When Jesus will have his heel bruised, he'll be dead for three days. But his death, Jesus' death, will conquer Satan. Conquer Satan, bruise his head. The pursuit of God to redeem his people is not over, though. Look at verse 21. I, there's a couple other things I could say. I'll just say this. Verse 21, And the Lord God made for Adam and for his wife garments of skin, and he clothed them. He takes the loincloths and gives them leather clothes. Previously they had fig cleaves. Now they have leather clothes. And this underscores two things. One, the seriousness and severity of sin. There was a need for a sacrifice. For there to be leather, an animal had to die. Blood had to be shed. Sacrifice had to be made. But second, in the ancient Near East, to cover someone with a garment, to cover someone, that's the language of a marriage. God is recommitting. He's repledging. He's recovenanting himself to his people. This is astonishing. The, the uh, Old Testament scholar Walter Brueggemann says this, the miracle is not that Adam and Eve are punished by sin, they sent out of the garden. The miracle is that they live. The facts warrant death. But God insists on life for his creatures. And so it is with us. We keep sinning. God keeps pursuing. Now we've been sprinting through this, but there's one more important thing I want us to see. We've seen the fall, the redemption. There's something we need to step back from the trees and see the forest. And that is the big picture. Because this has great explanatory power for your life. When you take... The dignity and the beauty of Genesis chapter 1 and 2. And you add to that the brokenness of the first half of Genesis 3, the fall. And then you thirdly add to that the second half of Genesis 3, the beginnings of redemption. You have a lens for understanding all of your life. Creation, fall, redemption. This is something that really happened and it helps you to understand your life. Creation, fall, redemption. Because Genesis 1 and 2 says that you have dignity. You are beautiful. You are made in the image of the living God. The first part of Genesis 3 says that you are broken though. You are deeply broken and sinful. But it also says in the second half of Genesis chapter 3 that you are loved and accepted. That God is redeeming you. You have more dignity. Let me say the way that I, I'm going to add something I say about once a quarter. You have more dignity. You have more honor. You have more beauty than you ever dare dream about yourself. You have more honor, dignity, and beauty than you ever dreamed about yourself. That's what Genesis 1 and 2 says. And you are more sinful and broken than you ever dared imagine. And thirdly, you are more loved and accepted than you ever dared hope. Genesis 1 to 3 explains the world and it explains your life. But I want to close by considering how this author depicts the first sin. Look with me real quickly. The middle of verse 6. It says that she took and she ate. She took and she ate. This simple act of disobedience in a garden Taking and eating, it undid humanity. It plunged us into a world of ruin, holocaust and hatred, evil and contempt, wars and abuse, all because our first parents took and ate. Whatever problem you are facing, whatever's on your mind, whatever the, the first problem on your mind this morning, it came because Adam and Eve took and eat in a garden all those years ago. She took and she ate. But you know that's not the last time we hear those words put together. In the scripture. On the last night of Jesus' life, pointing forward to his own death, Jesus broke bread and he said, Take and eat. 
And by so doing, he showed the sort of death he would die. Jesus knew God's word. He knew that the wages of sin was death. He knew there was a need for a sacrificial death. He obeyed, he submitted, he gave his life. And because of Jesus' obedience, because of Jesus' death, the words take and eat, the words take and eat, they are now words of salvation. They are words of life. What an amazing irony. The words that our enemy first heard and thought that he had won the battle, when he heard Adam and he, when he heard Adam and he said, take and eat, he thought he'd won. God now uses those same words at great cost to himself to show that God in Christ is the victor. He has disarmed the rulers and authorities. He has forgiven our sins. He has triumphed. What a great redemption that that first instance of take and eat resulted in shame and hiding and loincloths and covering. But now because Jesus hung naked on a cross, take and eat means our shame is covered. Our guilt is forgiven. Our sins are taken away. What a great salvation. What a great salvation. Let me pray for us. Our great God, we, uh, we thank you that you have given us this story, this reality that helps us to understand our life. But we thank you most of all Lord Jesus, that you took and that you ate, that you gave your life, that we might know forgiveness of sins, covering of shame, that we might know life eternal. For Christ's sake, amen. Let's stand now and sing together. Amazing grace. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. prepare ourselves now to receive the Lord's Supper, please join me as we confess our faith through the Apostles' Creed. Christian, what do you believe? I believe in God the Father Almighty, 
maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. As we come to this table this morning, we are reminded of the pain of Genesis 3 and the hope of Genesis 3. The pain of Genesis 3 is that because of sin, the sin of Adam and Eve and the sin of every single one of us, we deserved death. Someone's body had to be broken and someone's blood had to be shed in order to pay for sins. It also points to the good news that for those who believe in Jesus Christ, it is not us who will pay the penalty for that sin. It is Jesus Christ whose body was broken, whose blood was shed. His heel was bruised. He suffered, and in so doing, he crushed the serpent, and he crushed death, so that you and I, by faith, might have forgiveness and life. And we celebrate this as a meal, because through that forgiveness and life, we now have relationship, restored relationship with God, no guilt, no shame, no fear, only love. In a few moments, we are going to invite everyone on the floor forward and those in the balcony to the back uh, to celebrate this meal. You'll go to those who are serving. You'll take the elements as a family unit or a group of friends. You'll then make your way back to your seats, and we will celebrate this meal together as a church family. This meal is for all those who have professed faith, who have received Christ by faith and received Christian baptism in the name of the Father, Son, and the Spirit. And if that is not you this morning, we're so glad that you're here. You are hearing the words of life set before you, and we ask that you would respond to those words in faith. You may do so by remaining in your seat and considering these claims and responding to them, or by coming forward and you can cross your arms and we will offer a blessing to you. If you desire to take the meal but for any reason cannot come forward, please signal to your usher and we will bring the elements to you. For Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed took bread, and after giving thanks, he broke it, and he said, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after the supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he returns. Let me pray for us. Father, thank you for your mercy that you did not leave us in our guilt and our shame endlessly and pointlessly trying to cover our guilt and shame with something in this world. Thank you that you saw us in all of our misery, loved us, gave your son for us, and then clothed us in his righteousness. May we receive the good news of that this morning, and may we live in the good news of that, I ask in Christ's name. Amen. For those who are serving and the ushers, please make your way forward. Ushers, when the servers are in place, you can begin to dismiss row by row. What a friend we have in Jesus. All our sins and griefs to bear.
Christ's body broken for you, take and eat. Christ's blood shed for you, take and drink. Let's stand now and sing the doxology together. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here. Our song of sending today comes from Romans, May the God of Hope.
do hope as many as are able, everyone is invited to the congregational meeting. It'll start about five minutes after the benediction. Uh, there will be child care up through four years old, so you can leave your kids back there, check in with them maybe. Uh, but it, also just make sure you uh, try to greet, your, greet someone on the way out that you don't recognize. They may have been here 10 years, two weeks, you never know. So they may be the first time, you may be your first time. But otherwise, lift up your hearts and go out under this good word. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Go, friends, in the peace of Christ.